Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, nā mihi nui ki a koutou. Uh, good morning everybody, um, nice to see you all here uh, to talk about uh, our market study into the retail grocery sector this morning. I'm Anna Rawlings, I'm the Chair of the Commerce Commission, for those of you who don't know me, and with me today is Dr John Small, Commissioner, who's also worked on the study. I'm going to give you a short-ish uh, presentation and uh, then we're happy to take questions uh, about the study from you. As you know, in November last year, the government asked us to undertake a market study into the retail grocery sector in New Zealand. We've been looking at uh, whether competition in this sector is working well. During our study, we've spoken to many interested parties, industry participants, uh, a range of suppliers have engaged with us and completed a survey that we issued to them and over 12,000 consumers also responded to a survey that we issued asking them to tell us about their grocery shopping experiences. We've also undertaken a range of work in behavioural economics and other assessments of consumer behaviour to understand shopping habits. We want to thank everyone who's contributed to the study and in particular I want to thank the major grocery retailers Woolworths New Zealand and Foodstuffs North Island and South Island who've cooperated with us throughout and provided us with the information that we needed to date, particularly while tackling the challenges of New Zealand's response to COVID-19, which has been particularly prominent in the grocery sector. And I also want to note, just at this time, the contribution of the staff and our team working on this uh, study in recent months, and that work obviously will continue through coming weeks as we work towards our final report. We're looking forward to that continued engagement with all of those participants as we work towards November when we'll issue our final report uh, into this study. And so to discussion of our findings and recommendations this morning. First of all, I want to describe a little for you the sector landscape that we've been working with. None of us is a stranger to grocery shopping. Uh, we know what is available to us. But the retail grocery sector is made up of a range of retailers catering to a really diverse range of consumer preferences in this country. Prominent in the sector are two major operators of nationwide supermarket chains. They're well known to all New Zealanders. They are Woolworths New Zealand, who has the retail banners Countdown, Super Value and Fresh Choice, and Foodstuffs, which operates the banners Pack and Save, New World, Raywood Fresh and On The Spot. In addition to those major grocery retailers, there are a mix of other supermarkets and grocery retailers available to us. They include international food stores, convenience stores, online grocery retailers and meal kit providers increasingly. While some New Zealanders use these grocery retailers to top up or as a secondary destination to buy specialty items in their grocery shopping, by far and away our study has found that New Zealanders like to buy their groceries during a main shop. They shop weekly or at some other regular interval for that main shop and they like to do it in one location. They prefer that that one stop main shop is at a supermarket of one of the major grocery retailers. Taking this retail sector landscape, we've considered who competes with whom and how much. Some say that there is a trend away from a consumer preference for a main shop. But as I've said, we've found that this doesn't seem to be the case. This means that all other grocery retailers, including meal kit providers and online-only supermarkets increasingly, are more likely to be regarded by consumers as an alternative for their one-stop main shop. They provide consumers with some choice and they do meet some needs, but they can't compete with the major grocery retailers on price or range for a consumer's main shop. So in competition terms, what we have found is that the retail grocery sector can best be described as a duopoly with a fringe of other competitors. A range of evidence that we've looked at tends to support this view. First of all, national market share estimates suggest that the major grocery retailers have a combined market share of around 90% for that consumer's main shop. In addition, they have more than an 80% market share for top-up or secondary shopping missions by consumers. Other evidence suggests that the major grocery retailers really only consider one another when they're making decisions about pricing and about their retail offerings and about the establishment of new stores. 
We've also found that competition between the major grocery retailers appears weak. Each supermarket banner targets a different sector of the consumer population and they work hard to monitor one another and to maintain the differences between them. This means that they don't tend to compete head to head. Their market shares for groceries are also very stable over time and they usually in a workably competitive market we would expect there to be some winners and some losers and some changes in market share as retailers compete to win customers from one another. That doesn't seem to be the case in this market. This leads to our key finding in our draft report, which is that competition is not working well for consumers in the retail grocery sector in New Zealand. If competition was more effective, retailers would face stronger pressure to compete with one another and to deliver to consumers the right prices, the right quality, the right range of goods to satisfy their diverse range of preferences. All things being equal, this means that New Zealanders might pay less for the groceries that they buy today if competition was working better. In our study to reach this view, we've looked at a range of market outcomes that we typically consider are inconsistent with what we would see in a workably competitive market. Or put another way, we look at a range of outcomes to assess how competition is working. I'll talk shortly about our findings in relation to profitability and price and innovation in this sector. Uh, but after that, we've identified the aspects of competition that we think are contributing to the outcomes that we've observed. And finally, we've identified a range of options for recommendations that we think could improve the operation of competition in this market. The first market outcome that we've focused on is profitability. And we've observed that the levels of profit being earned by Woolworths New Zealand and foodstuffs are persistently high. And this level of profitability has been assessed using a range of different measures by our team. For example, this graph shows that the major retailers are earning excess levels of return on average capital employed, which determines what the retailers earned historically based on the value of the assets that they use to generate those earnings. The black and red lines on the graphs compare this profitability against their weighted average cost of capital, which is the benchmark that we use to assess a more normal rate of return. In addition, our examination of 35 business cases for the establishment uh, of new investment by major grocery retailers showed similar levels of projected profit, and these appear to have been achieved after those investments have been made as well. We've also compared the major grocery retailers' profit margin to those of overseas retailers, and there's more information of that, about that in our report. If competition was working better, we would expect these profits to encourage new entry into the market or expansion by other grocery retailers so that those profits could be shared among competitors and that usually would be expected to bring profitability back to a more normal level. We haven't seen that in this sector to date. In addition, consumers told us that grocery prices in New Zealand are high and they told us that they are higher than they experience overseas and you all will have heard this uh, commonly from time to time. The second market outcome we looked at therefore was price. While it's difficult to compare grocery prices internationally, it does appear that New Zealand prices are high in comparison with international benchmarks. The two data sets that we consider to be most reliable indicate that New Zealand was the sixth most expensive grocery market in the OECD in 2017 and New Zealand also ranked the sixth highest in the OECD in terms of the amount spent on groceries in that year. The final market outcome that we looked at was innovation. We've observed some innovation in the sector and it's familiar to most of us. For example, the supermarkets are diversifying products and services from time to time, like offering online shopping, self-checkouts, in-store pharmacies that consumers find to be useful, and more diverse product ranges such as those that cater to dietary preferences. But our assessment at the moment is that innovation appears modest by international standards and supply chain efficiencies also don't seem to be being passed through to consumers. Further, the profitability that we have described doesn't appear to represent a reward for investing in innovation as we might expect as businesses innovate. 
because those profits appear to be enjoyed across the spectrum, regardless of whether a firm is innovative or less innovative. As I said, we've looked for uh, competition aspects that might be contributing to these market outcomes, including how easy it is for competing retailers to expand their offering for consumers to compete for that consumer's main shop, uh, or to enter the market um, from the start. We don't consider that New Zealand is too small to accommodate a third grocery retailer of sufficiently large scale to compete with the major grocery retailers. But nevertheless, there's been no large scale entry over time, and we consider it highly unlikely that a new grocery retailer at the, at the scale that is required to compete is likely to enter the New Zealand market without some form of intervention. The first reason for this is that there appears to be a lack of competitively priced wholesale supply for a range of grocery products needed. The major grocery retailers are wholesalers, but largely to themselves. Foodstuffs also owns Trent's and Gilmore's, which are wholesalers, but primarily food service wholesalers, and they supply a few dairies, petrol stations and convenience stores only. While there are some other independent wholesalers for specific product categories, there is a lack of independent wholesale supply for a full range of grocery products. Smaller retailers like Dairies have told us that frequently they find that their best option is to buy groceries from one of the major grocery retailers to resupply through their convenience stores. And the only other choice, and a choice really only available to a wholesaler of sufficient scale, is that they enter into agreements with a full range of suppliers on a one-by-one -one basis. The second thing that we've identified uh, that we think is contributing to these outcomes is that there is a lack of suitable sites available for large-scale development. This, of course, is because land is in scarce supply in some highly um, populated urban areas in particular. But this is aggravated by the major grocery retailers using some tools to prevent sites being used by competitors. Those include lodging covenants on land that prevent those sites being used, and also using exclusivity covenants in leases to prevent other retail food outlets in particular from competing nearby. These practices weaken competition between the major grocery retailers, but they also insulate them from competition from others. We've also looked at issues that are affecting consumers in the retail grocery market, as I mentioned earlier. We've undertaken some wide-reaching research into pricing and promotional practices and their effect on consumers and on competition. This included the survey that I've mentioned, but also some behavioural economics work which looked at decision-making under conditions of complexity, in particular pricing complexity. And we commissioned other work into consumer behaviour which involved focus groups. Consumers are important to competition because when they're inclined to shop around, they encourage retailers to compete for their business through price and the quality and range of goods that they offer. They can compare product offerings when they're given good information about price, and through repeated consideration of prices in store, they develop a perception over time which enables them to make choices between stores. However, as many of you will know, the supermarkets use a vast range of pricing practices and promotional ticketing. Sometimes they use more than one pricing ticket for one product at any one point in time. Some of our behavioural work has found that the greater the number of offers provided to a consumer, the less likely the consumer is to make a purchasing decision that best meets the needs that they've identified before they went shopping. At this stage of our study, we consider that the frequency and prevalence of the major grocery retailers' pricing and promotional practices like specials and multi-buys and member-only discounts and everyday low pricing makes it hard for consumers to accurately assess the value of competing offers or develop accurate perceptions of value over time that help them to compare retailers with one another. This can be the case even when genuine savings are on offer and when information is clear. We're not talking here about conduct that necessarily would be misleading in breach of the Fair Trading Act. In addition, almost half of the consumers who responded to our survey told us that they always compare prices or they check unit pricing when they go shopping. 
However, the major grocery retailers don't use unit pricing in a consistent way, although many do use it. This limits its usefulness to consumers, in our view. And we also looked at loyalty programs. We've observed that consumers often don't understand the terms and conditions relating to loyalty programs, and in particular, they may focus on the value of the reward being offered to them and not the means by which they accrue it. For example, in order to obtain the common $15 a grocery voucher from Countdown, a consumer needs to spend $2,000. A limited understanding of the rewards accrued and redeemed through loyalty programs can make it difficult for consumers to compare loyalty programs with one another, but also to compare the offers provided by loyalty programs with other promotional discounts and offers. And finally, in relation to loyalty programs, we've found that consumers have a poor understanding of how their data is used and collected through the membership of a loyalty program. For example, loyalty memberships can be linked to payment cards used for grocery shopping, and consumer data is often sold on to third parties. This means that consumers who care about the way that their data is used may not be making informed decisions about whether to sign up to loyalty programs and obtain the benefits that they provide. And this can affect competition for those consumers. In relation to consumers, the final point I wanted to note is that consumer compa complaints about all kinds of supermarket conduct increased during the term of our study. There could be a range of reasons for that. Uh, one is the effect of COVID-19 on New Zealand grocery markets from time to time, particularly in Auckland uh, during the last 12 months or so. And the Commission also brought proceedings against Pack and, Pack and Save Māngari in relation to pricing discrepancies which obtained some profile and we know that that can sometimes encourage more complaints. In relation to these issues and other issues that have arisen throughout our study that could be relevant to other laws that we enforce, such as the Fair Trading Act in relation to pricing matters, we are separately considering what action may be required using our other enforcement and compliance functions. But for now, those matters sit outside of the scope of the market study. The final issue I wanted to talk about are issues facing suppliers. Our final preliminary finding is that competition is not working well for suppliers of groceries in the New Zealand market. Many had positive feedback about retailers supporting the development and ranging of their products, but many suppliers also described very common or similar negative experiences. Many of you will have heard some of these stories over time from the New Zealand Food and Grocery Council on behalf of New Zealand suppliers. With the sector dominated by two major grocery retailers and many suppliers reliant upon them to sell their products, we consider that there is an imbalance of bargaining power between the major grocery retailers and those who supply them. This can allow the major grocery retailers to use their buyer power to transfer risk or cost or uncertainty onto suppliers and those suppliers may have a fear of their products not being stocked unless they agree to the terms that are being offered to them. Some of the potentially harmful conduct that suppliers have told us about includes stockpiling products acquired at a discounted rate for promotion at retail, but those products then being sold after the promotion has ended. Suppliers have told us about bearing the cost of product that has been damaged or is unable to be sold, even though that damage occurred after the retailer took possession of the stock. And suppliers have told us about extended payment terms and waiting for up to 60 days for payment for their goods. We were also told about some conversations in which retailers sought to limit their suppliers from dealing with other competing retailers, or, or dealing with those retailers on competitive terms. This conduct can reduce suppliers' incentive to invest and innovate and it ultimately can lead to lower quality goods for New Zealand consumers and reduced choice being available. Clearly there is also the risk that suppliers may exit if they can't get their goods to market. This brings us to the case for change or our recommendations. We've developed a spectrum of potential options to improve competition. They encompass a range of possibilities and they're intended to start a discussion about the methods that might be employed to improve competition across the range of issues that I've described. I want to emphasise that during our consultation phase, 
We expect to receive a range of submissions from the parties that I've mentioned and to further discuss and test and analyse the options for recommendations that we've identified. The full spectrum is explored at this stage to enable that to happen. Ultimately, any decision for the implementation of any recommendation that we may make in our final report is one for the Minister and for Government. We believe that the best options for improving competition in New Zealand retail grocery markets are likely to be those that enable an increase in the number of competing retailers and an increase in the number of retailers that are competing effectively with one another. A necessary first step to support this is to increase wholesale access to a wide range of grocery products at competitive prices. And we've identified several options to achieve this. The first set of options would achieve wholesale supply through existing channels, and they can be thought of as behavioural in nature. The first is that the existing major retailers could undertake uh, to supply other retailers with groceries on competitive terms. And I'd note that each of them already appear to have some of the systems in place that may enable this to happen. That's either, either through subsidiaries or through direct supply. The second option we've identified is to achieve the same outcome but through a regulated access regime. <clears throat> we don't envisage that this would involve price regulation but simply access to supply on competitive terms. The separation of wholesale and retail businesses within the existing business unit may be required to enable this to take place in a competitive way. One further option we've identified is to support the creation of an effective and wholly independent wholesaler that could supply other retailers with wholesale groceries. For example, this could be done through the facilitation or sponsorship of an entirely new business. We've also identified one further structural option for achieving competitive wholesale supply, which could be considered if other options were not feasible or they were ineffective or they weren't going to achieve competition improvements within a desired time frame. That option would be to require the complete separation of the major grocery retailers wholesale and retail businesses into entirely separate businesses and one could also be sold to an independent third party. But I'd emphasise that this is a step that we would envisage only if others, at this stage, we would envisage only if other options uh, were not feasible or ineffective within the desired time frame. We also propose some measures that would make sites more readily available for large scale development of retail. These include potential changes to planning laws to ensure that competition considerations take greater prominence in planning decision making and also restrictions on the use of covenants and exclusivity arrangements in leases. These options for recommendations are premised on the idea uh, that competition might emerge if the conditions for entry and expansion are improved through access to competitive wholesale supply. But during consultation on our draft report, we really need to explore the likelihood of demand being sufficient to support an independent wholesale supplier. And to ensure that we're consulting on a full range of options, we've also identified options for directly intervening at the retail level to stimulate competition. The first option that we've identified again is the facilitation or sponsorship of entry, but this time of an independent retail operator at the retail level of the sector. The other option we've identified is requiring the grocery retailers to sell some of their stores to, to together create a third viable major grocery retailer. Again, I want to emphasise that we anticipate that those measures are only likely to be appropriate where the costs and risks and expected benefits are carefully assessed, and also where other efforts to stimulate competition through intervention in the wholesale market are ineffective or ineffective within a desired time frame or don't appear feasible and we hope to explore the feasibility of that through uh, our submission and consultation process. <clears throat> we also consider that the imbalance of power between major grocery retailers and their suppliers could be addressed through the introduction of a mandatory industry code of conduct and also changes potentially to restrictions against collective bargaining by suppliers who wish to deal with retailers on common terms and conditions of supply. 
Finally, we've identified some options to make it easier for consumers to make informed purchasing decisions and thereby encourage retailers to compete for their business. <coughs> me. These include the introduction of mandatory unit pricing uh, within retail stores and the major grocery retailers simplifying their promotional practices and ensuring that the terms and conditions of their loyalty programs are clear and transparent so they're more readily understood by consumers. And I'd note that the major grocery retailers have indicated to us that they're already working on simplifying some of their promotional practices. The next uh, steps in our study, as I've mentioned, uh, are to issue the draft report today and receive submissions from all interested parties on the content of our draft report. We welcome submissions from all parts of the industry, including from consumers, if they feel that they'd like to approach us. And we'll be holding a consultation conference in September to test some of the ideas that I've talked about today and to talk more about those submissions on our draft report. The feedback that we are considering will shape our final report, uh, which is due for provision uh, to the Minister by the 23rd of November. After that, it will be for the Minister and Government to decide uh, how to respond to our final recommendations. Happy to take any questions that you have. You've outlined in your, um, <coughs> I won't call them recommend, well, recommendations actually exactly what they were, um, essentially a calling for dismantling of the, the, the way that the supermarkets have their suppliers and the wholesale business at the same time and requiring supermarkets to essentially go as far as selling some of their stores. Is this essentially the stick? You're saying what's going to happen if they don't play ball beforehand? What we've outlined is a range of options at this stage that uh, could achieve the ultimate objective of increasing the supply of groceries at a, wholesale, at a wholesale level to any retailers who wanted to compete, whether that's the expansion of existing retailers or the introduction uh, of an entirely new one. And those options include, as I've outlined, uh, the option for structural separation and perhaps divestment of retail stores in the event that other options uh, didn't prove feasible or were, in, were implemented but were ineffective. Right, that's a very extreme step, essentially asking supermarkets to sell some of their own chains to bring in another competitor. Are you saying, or are you saying to the government that unless they get to this point, this is the final outcome? That's effectively uh, what I'm saying. So the, the range of options is there and we want to discuss all of those options uh, through this consultation period so that we can reach a recommendation that best meets the needs of increasing competition across the retail grocery market. And one of those options, which I've described, uh, may be possible if others proved infeasible or ineffective uh, is the separation of businesses of either for wholesale purposes or at the retail level. How would you do that? Would it have to be a change in legislation that would compel them to do this, or would you just ask nicely, essentially? Well, these are the issues that we want to engage uh, through our consultation process, but uh, clearly there would need to be some form of intervention to achieve this. If action was taken, how much money could consumers expect to save? So the market study looks at how effective competition is in the market, and we know that when competition is working well, retailers will compete to provide consumers with the groceries that they need uh, on price, the range that they offer, and the quality of groceries that they supply. So we don't look directly at what consumers are paying for groceries today and what they might pay in due course if competition uh, was more effective. But what we do know is that if competition is operating effectively, consumers could well pay less for the groceries that they buy today when competition is working better. And at this point, a lot of recommendations are in these draft findings. What would the main first steps be that you would want to see put in place? Well, again, it's a draft report and they are, it is a spectrum of, operate, of uh, recommendations which are laid out for the purposes of consultation. So uh, we expect to engage in that discussion over time. For example, uh, during our fuel market study and the consultation period, we received some really strong feedback about desirable options from those who were looking to enter or expand in the market. And that's what we're hoping for in this case as well. Anna, if you, if you did quite take the step of the firing, uh, change to sell off some stores. I mean, would you would you need to sell off some sub brands? I mean, could we perhaps have some you know, food stuff sort of things to sell, pack and save to somebody else, and you know, keep um, you know, the new world brands or individual stores? Have you got anything to 
to the structure of that? Well, again, that's something that we need to consult on. Uh, but we, uh, John might have a comment on this, but we'd envisage that we would be looking for a national um, spread of stores. And so at this stage, we don't uh, contemplate it would necessarily target one particular retailer and one particular chain. That's right. And I've just, just emphasised too, by the way, that, that, that the dismantling options um, don't actually, I mean, they improve the amount of competition, but they don't improve the physical layout of the store network. And so to make some of these other ones that involve stimulating a new retail chain may actually be more desirable. So these are the sort of things we want to flush out in consultation. And how hopeful, how hopeful are you that there could be some sort of voluntary um, agreement before we do these, these options? Obviously, the petrol market study, I think, said very early up front that you were hopeful of a sort of voluntary agreement. I think you're probably getting at the wholesale supply in particular, which is an issue that we've uh, identified through those behavioural options I've referred to, if you like, as access uh, to wholesale supply facilitated by the existing structures that are in place. And um, I, mean, I should emphasise that. Uh, foodstuffs and uh, Woolworths will be receiving this information along uh, with you for the first time in the spectrum of, of, of recommendations that we're looking at and uh, we are hopeful that they will engage with that information and engage with our consultation process to explore uh, which options might be uh, most feasible. It might also be worth emphasising here that the, the reason that we, we started with the wholesale end is because we actually know from the the fringe of competing retailers, there's a lot of demand from that set of retailers that are already in the market uh, for, for competitive wholesale supply. So that's something that would even help now without without any further retailers that would be a good first step. Can you describe that a bit more with that whole, is that for, you know, foodstuffs and Woolworths New Zealand, they're both supplying other more fringe retailers? So, so what we've identified is that uh, those retailers who are operating on what we've called the fringe, uh, the grocery retailers, are pre predominantly diversifying themselves on non-price dimensions and then competing by offering international food products that consumers want or a quality of product that is different or a range of products that is different. And what is lacking is the ability to access a full range of groceries at wholesale at competitive prices. And so that's what we're looking to facilitate, so that some of those existing retailers might expand their ranges and offering, uh, as well as potentially encouraging a new entrant into the market. And uh, the undertakings to supply at wholesale level uh, or an access regime to facilitate that supply could uh, require the major grocery retailers to enter into agreements with their competitors effectively to supply them at a wholesale level. Yeah, the, well, compared to, for example, in the fuel study, um, a bit higher and a bit more stable. Um, the, so you saw the chart there. It's a, what's it, what would you think a normal return on capex would be in a market like this? So our estimate, uh, at the top end of our range is a bit over six percent after tax. The the um, major grocery retailers themselves have a slightly higher figure, but not much higher. And our estimate of the Achieved rates of return are over 20%. That's several fold over what you Quite a lot higher. Yeah. They're not super profits. Well, they're, they're the kind of pro level of profits that we would expect if the market was working properly would have attracted competition. And so that's what set us looking for why hasn't that happened, what are the barriers to that happening, and hence to our recommendations. Did any of the, the fringe retailers you spoke with or others, you know, uh, express an interest in entering the market as a major third sort of party retail? What they've told us, uh, some of them, is, is that that access to a full range of grocery products at competitive prices is difficult for them and that prevents them from taking the next step. Before getting to divestitures, you talked about the need to see whether or not these options are working and you also said there might be a timeline in terms of it's going to take too long for, for the, the grocery market to, to become more competitive. Do you have a sense in your head of how long consumers are, are you be willing to wait before the 
government should look at that, that you know, more drastic option? Well, this is often something that's considered uh, in a regulatory regime, and, uh, and regulatory regimes sometimes provide for a, a form of intervention with a backstop, if you like, if it's not effective, uh, and for periods of review of effectiveness as well, and those are all options that uh, we are open to discussing through this consultation period. But no figure, two years, five years, a decade? I don't think we've fastened on a, on a figure at this point. And really, um, I'd emphasise too that ultimately uh, our task in the Commerce Commission is to identify how competition is working in this market and the steps that might be taken to improve competition, if any, and for those ultimate decisions about the form and shape of that uh, to sit with um, our policy matters that sit with the Minister and with Government ultimately. And when you talk about the need for incentives, is it your expectation that uh, a more competitive wholesale sector, along with the availability of land, would actually be enough to create a third competitor, or would there actually be a need for the government to actually provide some kind of incentive? That, that's something we're not really certain of, so that's one of the things that we really need to test in consultation, and that's, that's why, as, as Anna said, we have kind of retail um, solution kind of set of options in there as well. I mean, it may well be enough um, to, to get an independent wholesale supply, and you may free up a whole lot of sites, may well find some entrepreneur would be uh, willing to uh, to enter the market on those terms when currently they wouldn't. Have you found any evidence sorry, of, of, of something like this happening overseas where there's been a, a highly concentrated you know, duopoly uh, with anti-competitive characteristics that has become competitive through, through government intervention? Not, not in the grocery sector, we haven't, no. Um, we, we have looked widely internationally, um, and New Zealand's issues appear to be unusually difficult. Our, markets are, uh, our market is unusually concentrated with two major players, and some of the options that we've identified, like a code of conduct, there is precedent for overseas, so it depends on which of the options we're looking at as well, I think. But yeah. John's talking about the more structural ones, which I think is what you probably were getting at. We identify in our report a range of um, conduct and we've assessed that conduct in terms of its effect on competition and we do acknowledge in some areas that um, that conduct also could uh, cause us to look more closely at whether there may be any breaches of competition laws or of fair trading laws that we enforce as well. So I think I uh, said in the presentation that the scope of that assessment falls outside the scope of the market study, uh, but we will be considering further if uh, whether any action is required using our other compliance and enforcement functions. Broadly on the content, does what you have seen from the Food Grocery Council and others, does that amount to bullying? Sorry, does that amount to? Bullying. We've had uh, reports from suppliers of the kind of conduct that um, I've outlined, and also uh, you will have all heard reports in, in the media and through um, the Food and Grocery Council about the same type of conduct that we've heard about. Uh, what we're assessing is how that conduct or the themes that arise from that conduct may be impacting competition. And the way it impacts competition is that it limits the incentives for suppliers to invest or to innovate and that can affect the offer that's provided to consumers and ultimately if suppliers exit the market, it can affect the range that is available to consumers as well. So we've identified the conduct and described it in quite uh, some detail, or the detail that we can, whilst preserving the confidentiality of those who have spoken to us, and uh, and we've assessed its likely impact on competition. Can you give us an example? Yeah, um, just on the question about a, a potential third retailer, I'm just wondering if you can give us an idea of which international players you might have spoken to and what sort of impressions they're giving about the market of potential so you'll appreciate that uh, the market study is looking at competitive dynamic. Competitive dynamics are highly commercially sensitive across the entire spectrum. Suppliers have been concerned to protect their anonymity and the commercial sensitivity of their information, and potential competitors have been very concerned also to protect the confidentiality of their information because uh, otherwise it sends signals about uh, potential competition in the market. So we've identified uh, themes and, uh, that I've described today, but um, we're not in a position to discuss the specific strategic planning of any particular 
uh, potential nutrient or existing competitors are looking to expand. And in terms of those those themes, anything else that um, that they've been saying in terms of those potential barriers to, to entry, without naming any specific. Uh, well, I think the, but the barriers to entry is um, is basically come from our analysis. You know, Put, stand yourself in the shoes of somebody who might want to enter and say, what are, what are the hurdles? And some of it we can see from the hurdles to expansion from the existing retailers, such as the, the access to groceries. The sites are an obvious uh, barrier since land is generally uh, hard to come by with development sites, particularly in urban areas. So once you've got covenants on them as well, that's a, clearly a, a, a significant restriction. So those, sorts, those are the main kind of barriers that we're, we're trying to tackle. Um, and they've come more from our own analysis than from uh, third parties telling us that if you do this, we'll come, for example. Could you give us a specific example of one item at a grocery store that you think has been overpriced because of this anti-competitive behaviour? No. <laughs> um, so we haven't, we haven't assessed, and there are, there are others uh, who from time to time do assess the price of goods in a basket of goods. Uh, what we have looked at, and the purpose of the market study, is to look at how competition is operating to affect the, the supply of all grocery products. And price is one dimension upon which we expect uh, wholesalers and retailers to be competing. But in addition, uh, consumers benefit when they compete across the range of products that they offer and the quality of products that they offer. So for example, acceptance of a lower quality of product at a lower price is, um, is, ex is an acceptable competitive outcome whilst higher priced goods of luxury quality are also offered. What we've focused on are the competitive dynamics across the entire spectrum and uh, competition across that spectrum of price, range, service, quality. Um, so Countdown's put out a statement saying that this, they haven't read the full report yet, but that it would have significant implications for them. Um, what do you say to, to businesses like that that count down the foodstuffs that might be worried about the implications of this report? Well, it comes as no surprise to us that uh, the recommendations at the end of the spectrum that we've talked about to do with uh, divestment and structural separation, of course, would have significant implications for businesses. But those are not the only options that we've identified, and I think I've explained the extent to which um, we consider that those options might be required. And uh, the options are laid out in full in the draft report in order to facilitate that kind of discussion through our consultation process, and we fully expect to engage, as we have throughout, with uh, those like Countdown in relation to those issues. Are you hoping that the more extreme recommendations, like the, the disestablishment and the creation of a, of a third um, business, for example, are you hoping that will kind of, not threaten, but, but urge them to comply with the, the softer ones? The, the purpose of laying out the options is to assess what options will best achieve the ultimate objective of achieving effective competition in these markets for the benefit of New Zealand consumers, and we're looking to discuss all of them. And when it comes to unit pricing, were you surprised by the, the lack or the inconsistency of it in New Zealand, given that when you shop in the UK, uh, it, it's on everything? Well, what we really um, targeted was that consumers told us that they like to compare prices, that they find that to be difficult. Uh, that unit pricing assists with that. Unit pricing is used in New Zealand supermarkets, but we found that it's not used on a consistent basis. And we consider that if it was used consistently, given what consumers have told us, it might assist them in their decision making and improve competition in that way. And is that something that you want to be mandatory, that when you go shopping you can compare that, that price per kilo or per 100 grams on everything? That's what's uh, proposed in this time. Alright, well we might leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Yeah, thanks so much.